this weekend was really cool for me. Why? Well, I had a local meetup, you know, meetup.com. I think y'all have that all over the world, right? It's not just here in the States, meetup.com. You can go in, you can enter your zip code, and it'll just bring up a list of meetings in your area. You can filter it based on your interest. And so about a month ago, I developed a Lightworkers Lab spiritual development group just to see who is out there in North Texas. And it's really interesting because I found myself in Denton, Texas. I can't say Denton because apparently my husband thinks that's ridiculous. Just like when I say pecan, he's like, it's pecan. It's Denton. I live in Denton, Texas, and it's like an Austin. It's really progressive. There's a lot of cool, youthful energy, people with pink hair and tattoos. You know, I love all that. Lots of vegan food, lots of different, it's just a lot of dynamic activity here. And so I just wanted to see what's going on out there, people. I developed a meetup, and on Sunday, we had our first gathering, and it was really cool. Um, I'm going to say 12 or 15 people showed up, which is cool. And I was able to meet some really neat people. Shockingly, there were some people who showed up from Shreveport, Louisiana. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you drove here from Shreveport? Damn, thank you. And there was other people who drove from like East Texas. I don't know where because I don't know Texas, but like Lubbock, like three hours like to come and see me and to come and meet other people because truly that's how it is out there for us, isn't it? It's hard finding people of like mind or finding people who are interested in just soaking up the learning. And it was cool for me because most of what I do is online. Of course, I did the retreat last year and I'm a part of a group called Toastmasters. And so I do speak and stuff, but mostly I'm online and I don't get to look out and actually see people out there. So it was neat to see faces, but I didn't know anybody except one person. I didn't know anybody. It was nobody from the lab. Nobody that I knew except one person from YouTube, but I had never met them or seen them. It was just kind of, <laughs> hi, how you doing? So it was cool observing myself, sort of teaching and talking to people. But what I wanted to mention was this one woman who asked a question at the end of the session. She was, she was kind of a quiet lady. She's really cool. But she mentioned an experience that she had, and she, she said that, she was in a time in her life of pain, and she explained what that was, and I, I won't share the details of that because it's private or whatever, but she, she was in a moment in her life of pain. She was a child, and she remembers having an experience in that moment, so a moment within a moment, where of a sudden she just felt like somebody was hugging her. Somebody was comforting her and acknowledging that she was suffering or acknowledging that she was in a challenge. And Spirit started showing me a bunch of things. And I, I listened to her. And then when she was finished, I said, do you know who that was? She said, well, I guess it was maybe a spirit guide or maybe it was an angel. And I said, it was you. It was you. And she said, what do you mean it was me? I said, did you know that you can time travel? which of course the whole room goes quiet and they're like looking at this weird lady. <laughs> I'm like, but did you know that you can time travel? And she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, you can time travel from this moment in the present all the way back into a memory of an experience that you had where you were hurt, changed, traumatized, abused, and you can go back into that memory, a kind of time travel, and you can locate yourself. You can find yourself there, and you can give yourself a hug. You can whisper into the ear of seven-year-old Crystal Ann Compton, and you can say, I love you. I know it's really hard right now, but it's going to be okay. I said, did you know that you can do that? She said, no. I, didn't, I don't know that I can do that. And I said, well, what if later on tonight you went home, and you went into your meditation room, and you took maybe 15 or 20 minutes to get into a really meditative space. And then in your mind's eye, the eye of the spirit, you conducted a visualization where you went back into that moment where you remember being hugged. What were you wearing? How old were you? 
Where were you geographically? What house? What space? Who was around you? Locate yourself tonight in a meditation. And when you do, go give yourself a hug. Do you know that if you do that, it's likely that the hug you felt all those years ago is a hug that you gave yourself tonight, a hug that you haven't even given yourself yet. Of course, the mind begins to expand, right? The mind begins to bend, and she's like, well, okay, what are you talking about? And I said, I'm talking about soul retrieval. I'm talking about whole soul integration. It's possible. This is part and parcel with us being magical beings and the healers of our lives. We often look outside of ourselves. Somebody, please help me. Is there a God in the sky? giving demerits or taking them away who can maybe help me, maybe give me something, maybe heal me from my illness, maybe save me from this terrible relationship, somebody, somewhere, heal me. Well, you are the powerful person. You are the magical person that can heal yourself, and you can do it right now. You can do it later tonight. You can do it through a series of experiences. You can do it for the rest of your life. Now, some of us Correct me if I'm wrong. We went through some real, real bad stuff, right? Real bad stuff. Some of us were children like myself, had a terribly violent father. You know, not just, I mean, I've said this before, but let me repeat it. Like people who have been abused, we tend to qualify and categorize violent abuse and you know a smack is is it's not really that violent this is on this end of the violent spectrum and then all the way on the other end of the violent spectrum we have really bad abuse that which we do not want to speak of because to speak of it would let you know that it's even possible and I don't want to do that to you that's the kind of stuff some of us came out of for example, me. Some of us maybe went to war and saw that kind of stuff. Some of us went into marriages and saw that kind of stuff. Some of us might be in marriages and relationships and experiences where we are now seeing that kind of stuff. It was curious because when this lady was talking, I had a memory of myself. I used to live in a house. We call this now, my brother and I, the How Nani House. It, it was in Volcano Hawaii. You know where that volcano is erupting right now? That's in Volcano Hawaii. And I lived in a place where, from my back porch, you could see fountains of lava. It was a wild, dynamic place to grow up. And it was also terrifying, terrifying to be in the middle of a jungle with a dad who was off his rocker, so very abusive as a child, myself and my brother. And I remember one night, and, and I remembered as she was talking, my own experience. And it was so fast, and, and I've thought about it since then, but I really didn't go deeper until I heard this lady speak. My brother and I always shared a room because we were really, really poor, and we usually barely had a couple of rooms to live in and barely had electricity and things like that. And so my brother and I, up until the time he left to go get married, we shared a room. And I remember probably being about seven years old, and so he would be about nine years old, and we were in our room, and the entire energy of the house, you know, it was quaking. It was just undulating with the pain of what was happening in that space. And that, that undulation, that vibration was showing up in my physical body. It was making me tremble and causing my teeth to chatter. It was so scary to be essentially without electricity in a hut, if you will, with a father on the war path, just terrifying. And I remember huddling up against my brother and my brother huddling up against me. And then a moment happened, again a moment within a moment. And it was as if I was taken up out of my body, taken up to a 1,000 foot view where I could look down and see myself huddling there with Jesse, my brother, and see kind of the top of my house and what was going on and even where my mother and father were and what they were doing. And in that space and in that place, I felt incredible 
peace. I could see what was going on, and, and yes, I was connected to it to some degree, but I wasn't, my, feet, my teeth weren't chattering. My body wasn't shaking. I was separated from it. I was, it was as if I was in this bubble of peace. It's hard to explain. And I don't know how long you followed me online and if you've heard me talk about soul retrieval, but I often talk about seven-year-old crystal. Have you noticed that? Seven-year-old crystal, and then I'll go to 13-year-old crystal, but I'll bop around the ages, but I'm usually always landing on seven-year-old crystal. Well, I was seven years old when that experience happened. And I used to think, well, I probably just separated. I split. I popped out of my body, man. It was too much. And that makes sense. But now, what I actually think happened, because I've revisited that moment in my own soul retrieval, is that moment of peace that I can still remember experiencing as a child, that weird vantage point, that sphere of protection that I felt, that too was me. That too was me creating a space of safety for myself. Because for years now, I've been traveling those timelines. For years now, I've been on the hunt. Not the bad kind of hunt, the good kind of hunt, where I retrieve that which is lost. For those of us who have endured abuse, okay, acute abuse, PTSD, abuse, a lot of us lose time. We do, we lose time. I have probably about 40 to 50% of my childhood that is, is not available to me because I don't remember it. I remember periods of eighth grade and then I remember the middle of ninth grade, things like that. It's just blank because the mind does seek to protect us from the energy that has done damage to us. And so for years now, I've been on the hunt for pieces of myself. And I've gone back into that moment, but I forgot that I felt it all those years ago. I forgot that I felt that peace that surpasses all understanding. And I would have said to myself, if I were in Christianity or in religion, I would have said, well, that was God placing his hand on me. And in a way, that's true, because there is a God that lives in me. God moves and acts and creates in this reality through me and through my mind. I was the one who provided myself with that safety. I was, that, I was the one that provided myself with that 1,000 foot view, showing myself that I was outside of it, that I could stand outside of it, that there was a space and a place and a feeling that existed that wasn't that. And I don't remember, again, much of my childhood, but who knows, maybe I carried that with me. Maybe I stitched that into the fabric of my days and remembered that. I don't remember, but I remember it now. Time is a construct of this reality. It's not a construct of outside of this reality, fifth dimensional reality, sixth dimensional reality and consciousness. Time doesn't exist there. And outside of dimensions altogether, where we exist in totality as the I am of who we are, there is no time. And the crystal at seven years old exists in a space that is timeless. Energy is what we are, right? We've all heard that, and when you observe us on a microscopic level, the most basic foundational level of who it is that we are, we are but light, energy. And does energy ever die? No. That's not spirituality. That's science. Energy cannot die. It can transmute. It can change. But the energy of who it is that we were didn't just go away as we grew and changed. There is energy still left in these locations. There are still aspects of ourselves still left in these locations for those of us who were changed. And it doesn't even have to be due to trauma, by the way. It can just be a moment, something somebody said to you that changed the course of your life, that changed how you thought about yourself, that, that impinged upon you imbued into you a belief that limits you now. It doesn't have to be something abusive. It could be anything like that. In those moments, you left residual energy there. You left parts of yourself there. 
You want to clean up those limiting beliefs. You want to clean up these aspects of yourself that you seek to bring into alignment with the reality of who it is that you are. Then you might want to think about running those timelines and going out on the hunt and looking for those pieces of yourself and hugging you wherever you were when you were hurt and gathering you up unto yourself and saying, Crystal, you're safe. It's okay. I know it's hard right now. I know what you're seeing is terrifying, but you're okay. Or one step further, Crystal, come with me. I'm here. I got you. You're safe now. And integrate that aspect of who you were into yourself. That's how you heal yourself. You heal yourself into a state of wholeness. It's powerful. It's time travel. Neville Goddard, who I don't think I, do I bore you? <laughs> let's get to the Goddard. It's like get him to the Greek. No, let's get him to the Goddard. Neville Goddard talked about reimagining things that happened in our past. And so if we want, we could take this a step further, my friends. We could take it from giving our seven-year-old self a hug that she so desperately needs and a vantage point that she didn't know is possible to a message of, you're safe now. Come with me now. I can take you out of this. You don't have to stay in this moment, in this experience. Come with me and integrate into the whole of who it is that we are. You can take it one step further, you know. You can reimagine everything that took place in the first place. What was that for me? Well, without getting into gory details, it was the demonstration of false power. It was the abuse of power. It was the betrayal on a fundamental level of love of unconditional love. It was a bastardization of what a parent and child should be to one another and what a husband and a wife should be to one another. It was evil and it was wrong. And the words that arose out of that interaction were evil and they were wrong. And they spoke into my mother conditions and beliefs that changed her until she passed. And I heard them spoken to the woman that gave birth to me, now stitched into the woman I was becoming. And how did those words change me? Do you know what I mean? How did seeing that change me? How did it cause me to mistrust, distrust, dismiss? What did it embolden me to do? What is the distorted emboldenment in me? Oh, there's some distorted emboldenment in me. Let me tell you something. Meet me in my 20s and get on my bad side and you'll meet a dragon. A dragon, a smart one. A smart one with no filter. Who All she ever saw was people hurting people. And that's all she ever knew how to do. That's what that did to me. And there's still parts of me. Still parts of me deep down because there's always the work. I tell you this all the time, my loves. There's always the work. I always have work. Sometimes I'll see something, especially if it's around injustice, especially if it's around like misogyny, abuse of lesser, weaker, like animals, children, women. Like and when I, I, where's my nunchucks? Where's my nunchucks? I don't care how old I am. I want to go to battle. Like it's this response that I have in me. And of course, anytime we have a reaction that's counter to or not in alignment with love, then we know we got some work to do. That's just a neon sign out in Vegas saying, Crystal, here it is. Here's your work, honey. Go deeper. Find it because it's still inside of you. And I still have those places where I need to do the work. So you know what I can do? I can travel the timelines. I can go back in time and I can reimagine that night. My brother and I weren't huddling in our bedroom. We had electricity. There was some fun music playing. My father and my mother, they're cooking dinner. 
And my father was saying to my mother, I love you so much. I value you. And I'm so grateful for the family that we have. And I walk in and I say, hey, can I help dad? He says, of course you can help. I know this sounds corny, but stay with me. Of course you can help. Lifts me up, helps me chop vegetables, helps me to cook. And then we sit at a table and we eat together as a family. And my father blesses the food. And he looks at all of us and he tells us how much he loves us. And he says, Crystal, wow, you're doing great in school. I love what you're doing in school. Tell me about your day. I'm interested in you. Did you know how intelligent you are? And what a beautiful young woman you're becoming. I can imagine traveling the timelines an entirely different experience. And if I can, at the same time, muster within me the feeling of that, which is the vibration of that. If I can respond in my heart to my father saying that to me in my imaginal mind, Crystal, I'm so proud of you. Crystal, I love you and I'm here to protect you. If I can feel that while at the same time visualizing that, I can create that. I can create it then. I can change the reactions that I have now to that then. I can cut the cords of that and in my present day, my life must adjust around me. My life must become an out picture of the new reality within me where my father loved me unconditionally. This is not delusion. This is creation. This is not denial. This is magic. This is consciousness and action. This is becoming the designer of my life. I can do that. I can see my father as I want him to be. I can visualize him saying these things to me. And I will be healed. And my father will be healed too. Wherever he is. Mahalo. And if he were alive, I could spend time in meditation. Go to the Goddard. He talks about this. And we're going to read a chapter tonight about this. If my father were alive, I could spend time in controlled revelry, in my imaginal mind, controlled, however, being very intentional about what I'm imagining. And I can see my father healthy, not addicted, loving, not angry, not abusive. And I can create a new reality for him. And his subconscious will receive it. It will. That's how transmissions work. They're telepathic and they're magnetic, and his subconscious will receive it. Now, can he click out of that and then reject it? Yes. Yes. This is how we see healings take place. Legitimate healings take place. And then the person gets sick again because they clicked out of the truth that was spoken into them. They got in their own conscious reasoning about it, and they dislodged the shift within themselves. I could do that if my father was still alive, but he's not alive. He's passed. I could do that if my mother was still alive. I could help her. If, if, I, if I knew, I would have. I, I didn't then, though. Who in your life could you heal? Who in your life could you reimagine? What you in your life could you reimagine yourself to be? What you in your life could you rescue right now? Could you love into wholeness? Could you say, hey, I'm right here. I'm right here. Come with me. You're safe. Because that aspect is still out there alive. Energy never goes away. It just changes. Why don't you change it into the whole of who you are? Don't you see how powerful you are? What do I say all the time, like a broken record? I say, as a man speaks, so he is. The actual scripture out of Proverbs says, as a man speaks within himself, so he is. But let's put a fine point on it. You want to? Because this is what it really means. As a man speaks about himself, so he is. Because we can think about this or that. I can be driving home from wherever thinking about Maybe get a pizza, maybe, maybe make a salad. What am I having for dinner? That's not who I am, though. 
We're talking about a different kind of thinking. We're talking about a thinking that's tied to our being, our belief about who it is that we are. If you want to change your life, if you want to change your now, if you want to change your past, and if you want to rendezvous with your future, you've got to speak the right way. Right is a judgment, but here I'm going to use it because there's a right way to speak about yourself. And you can only speak, your, speak about yourself in a living way if you know who you are. If you know who you are and who do you say that you are. Who do you say that you are? I say, I am that I am. We had a great conversation in the lab today. Well, what does that actually mean? And if you look at the Hebrew of what it means, it means I am the consciousness. I exist. I am. But it also means I move. I do. I think. I'm becoming something. I create. This is in alignment with my teaching about energy versus vibration. Energy is pure consciousness. It's the I am. It's the who you are in totality. Vibration is how you move. Vibration is how you exist. Vibration is how you live. That's who I say that I am. I am that I am. I'm a consciousness that's moving. I'm a consciousness that's existing. And this is how I choose to live, how I choose to think. And this is how I choose to have my being. Who do you say that you are? When you speak from your belief, what are you creating for yourself? Your present self and your past self and your future self. The root of all suffering is a fundamental misunderstanding of who it is that you are. People are real ready, aren't they, to tell everybody else what they got to do. Oh, here's your problem, hon. You got to fix that. Or I see exactly what's going on in that relationship. You need to do this and you need to do that. We're a lot less comfortable, though, looking inward and figuring out for ourselves who we truly are and what we need to do, how we need to bring ourselves into alignment with the reality of who it is that we are. And he called the unseen as if it were, and the unseen became seen. And he called the unseen that which has not been created yet, manifested yet, as though it were. And the unseen became seen. That's who you are. Powerful. Before we get into some Goddard, and I speak to the healers out there, and here's a hint. We're all called to be healers. Healers of our own lives. Healers of our own story. Healers of our own space. Healers of everything we come into contact with. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do that, would you grant me a moment to redefine a hymn? To redefine a hymn. Last week we talked a little bit about the way we came up through organized religion, having to call ourselves wretches and call ourselves, in some cases, worms. We refer to ourselves in the religious system as unworthy, seeking to be transformed somehow by an external force, a guy who's got to die for us and die for our sins in order for us to be worthy. And see, this is not how it works. Original sin, I'm not going to get into St. Augustine and how that all came about and became a part of teaching. We weren't born in sin. We were born into our divinity. We were born to be co-creators in this reality. And if we're not creating intentionally, if we are not healing intentionally, then we are misusing our time and our energy in this life. We are powerful beings created in perfection by the source of all things. That's what is real. That's who you are. Speak from that as a man speaks of himself, as a woman speaks of herself. So she is. That's when you begin to manifest exactly what it is that you truly desire to manifest for yourself. A hymn, reimagined. <clears throat> Pardon my voice. I don't purport to be a great singer. But how does this sound to you, my friends? <sighs> oh. 
O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds our hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, our power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul Creator God in me, how great we are, how great we are, then sings my soul, Creator God in me. How great we are, how great we are. And that is what we are. A hymn reimagined. Now, my friends, let's go to the Goddard resurrection. One chapter only. We can do it. Stay with me. There's power, power, wonder work in power in these words. Now, whether you understand them because they're written in a kind of old timey way or not is almost immaterial because there are coded truths in this writing. There are vibratory correlates here. As I speak these words of truth, they will be mirrored within your consciousness. And if you receive them, they will embed and they will give life to something because these are life giving words. This chapter we're going to be listening to tonight, or you're going to be listening to, is the law of thought transmission, which comes out of the book Prayer, The Art of Believing, which you can get in this compilation work called Resurrection by Neville Goddard. You ought to have it. I'm not going to beat you over the head with it. I tell you every day, get it. Get this book. Chapter 5, Law of Thought Transmission. Quote, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. I sent my word to seven-year-old Crystal and I healed her and I delivered her from her destructions. He transmitted the consciousness of health and it awoke its vibratory correlate in the one toward whom it was directed. Crystal sent her consciousness of safety, health, and security, and it awoke its vibratory correlate in the one toward whom it was directed, seven-year-old Crystal, do you see? He mentally represented the subject to himself in a state of health and imagined that he heard the subject confirm it, quote, for no word of God shall be void of power. Therefore, hold fast the pattern of healthful words which thou hast heard. And God lives within you. For no word of the God that lives within you shall be void of power. Therefore, hold fast the pattern of healthful words which thou hast heard. To pray successfully, you must have clearly defined objectives. And here we're going to get into healing and how it really works and how it works every single time. You must know what you want before you ask for it. You must know what you want before you can feel that you have it. 
And prayer is the feeling of fulfilled desire. It does not matter what it is that you seek in prayer or where it is or whom it concerns. You have nothing to do but convince yourself of the truth of that which you desire to see manifested. That's it. When you emerge from prayer, you no longer seek, for you have, if you've prayed correctly, subconsciously assumed the reality of the state sought, and by the law of reversibility, which we learned about last week, your subconscious assumption must objectify that which it affirms. To objectify means to make an object out of it, to have it be created in your reality. You must have a conductor to transmit a force. You may employ a wire, a jet of water, a current of air, a ray of light, or any intermediary whatsoever. The principle of the photophone, or the transmission of voice by light, will help you to understand thought transmission, or really telepathic transmission. The sending of a word to heal another. There is a strong analogy between a spoken voice and a mental voice. To think is to speak low. To speak is to think aloud. Let's read that again. To think is to speak low. To speak is to think aloud. The principle of the photophone is this. A ray of light is reflected by a mirror and projected to a receiver at a distant point. The back of the mirror is a mouthpiece. By speaking into the mouthpiece, you cause the mirror to vibrate. A vibrating mirror modifies the light that's reflected onto it. The modified light has your speech to carry, not as speech, but as represented in its mechanical correlate. It reaches the distant station and impinges on a disc within the receiver. It causes the disc to vibrate according to the modification that it undergoes, and it reproduces your voice. Quote, I am the light of the world. I am, which is the knowledge that I exist, is a light by means of which what passes in my mind is rendered visible. Memory, or, or my ability to mentally see what is not objectively present, Timeline travel, for example, proves that my mind is a mirror and so sensitive a mirror that it can reflect a thought. The perception of an image in memory in no way differs as a visual act from the perception of my image in a mirror. The same principle of seeing is involved in both. I see myself in a mirror. I see myself in a memory. Your consciousness is the light reflected on the mirror of your mind and projected in space to the one of whom you think. By mentally speaking to the subjective image in your mind, you cause the mirror of your mind to vibrate, to vibrate, to begin to take form, to begin to create. Your vibrating mind modifies the light of consciousness reflected upon it. The modified light of consciousness reaches the one toward whom it is directed and impinges on the mirror of his mind. It causes his mind to vibrate according to the modifications that it undergoes. Thus, it reproduces in him what was mentally affirmed by you. I visualize my father in my mind. I visualize the conversation with my father in my mind. I visualize my father's healing. I visualize my father's prosperity. And that visualization is a vibration. It is a transmission of thought that is received by my father. Received by my father and causes a correlating vibration within him. That's what you have to understand. That's how healing is done. Healing isn't done because you're laying hands on someone and you're so powerful and you're so awesome. Nope. 
Healing is done only when you hold a vision of the person or the being you wish to heal in your mind's eye, visualizing them in a state of health and wholeness or feeling in your body. You may heal in a different way, but feeling, transmitting through the feeling, their health into them and their subconscious, the mirror of their conscious mind, which is how Neville is describing it, receives that healing transmission. Your beliefs, your fixed attitudes of mind, constantly modify your consciousness as it is reflected upon the mirror of your mind. Your consciousness, modified by your beliefs, objectifies itself or manifests itself in the conditions of your world. To change the world, you must first change your conception of it. To change a man, you must first change your conception of him. You must believe him to be the man that you want him to be and mentally talk to him as though he were. All men are sufficiently sensitive to reproduce your beliefs of them. Did you hear that? All men, all people are sufficiently sensitive. We're energy. Energy talks to energy are sufficiently sensitive to reproduce your beliefs of them within themselves. Therefore, if your word is not produced visibly in them, the cause is to be found in you, not in them. As soon as you believe in the truth of the state affirmed, results have to follow. Neville likes to call these concrete Facts to repeat, as soon as you believe in the truth of the state you're affirming, results have to follow. Everyone can be, therefore, transformed. Every thought can be transmitted. Every thought can be visibly embodied within ourselves, within our lives, but also within others. Subjective words which are subconscious assumptions, awaken what they affirm. Quote, they are living and active and shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing whereto I send them. End quote. Let's read that again. Repetition, by the way, is a tool of the subconscious. The more you repeat it and feel it, the more it embeds or impregnates the subconscious. So if you want to impregnate the subconscious with words of life, with words of manifestation, you repeat them. Quote, they are living and active and shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing whereto I send them. They are endowed with the intelligence pertaining to their mission and will persist until the object of their existence is realized. They persist until they awaken the vibratory correlates of themselves within the one toward which they are directed. But the moment the object of their creation is accomplished, they cease to be. What he's saying here is that the alive visualization, the alive words, the alive transmission that we're sending to the one that we seek to heal will change them and shift them. But the vibration, the transmission itself ceases to be once the change is affected. The words spoken subjectively in quiet confidence will always awaken a corresponding state in the one for whom it was spoken. But the moment its task is accomplished, it ceases to be, permitting the one in whom the state is realized to remain in the consciousness of the state affirmed or to return to his former state. So I think of my father, Dennis Milligan, and I send him healing and I see him as healed. I see him as having conversations with me about his healing and his restoration. And that transmission is received by Dennis Milligan. And he can exist in the consciousness, consciousness of that. His being can allow that to root and to grow, or he can move out of the consciousness or the life of that. Whatever state has your attention holds 
your life. Did you hear that? Whatever state has your attention holds your life. What are you thinking about? No, what are you feeling about? That holds your whole life. That's how your life is created. Therefore, to become attentive to a former state is to return to that condition. Quote, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old, because you go back into the energy of them. This is why I say shadow work is sticky, sticky work. Because when we remember seven-year-old Crystal, we can get stuck there in the pain of that, in the agony of that, in the energy of that, and we can take on the energy of that, and it changes us in the present. Whatever state has your attention holds your life. Nothing can be added to man, for the whole of creation is already perfected within him. Quote, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Heaven is your subconscious. Not even a sunburn is given from without. The rays without only awaken corresponding rays within. Were the burning rays not contained within man, all the concentrated rays in the universe could not burn him. Were the tones of health not contained within the consciousness of the one of whom they are affirmed, they could not be vibrated by the word which is sent. You do not really give to another. You resurrect that which is asleep in another. Wow, crown chakra activation, mahalo keakua. You do not really give to another. You resurrect that which is asleep within them. Quote, the damsel is not dead, but she sleepeth. Death is merely a sleeping and a forgetting. Age and decay are the sleep, not the death, of youth and of health. Recognition of a state vibrates or awakens it. We recognize the healthy state of another. We recognize and feel and visualize the successful, prosperous, happy, and joyful state of another, and in doing so, transmit the vibration of that and resurrect within them, awaken within them, the vibratory correlate so that they can experience it. Of course, at that point, free will, which is the rule of this dimension, takes precedent. And they can either stay in the consciousness of that which has been awakened or they can move out of it. Distance, as it is cognized by your objective senses, does not exist for this objective mind. Quote, if I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me. Time and space are conditions of thought. The imagination, the imagination can transcend them and move in a psychological time and space. Although physically separated from a place by thousands of miles, you can mentally live in the distant place as though it were here, your imagination can easily transform winter into summer, New York into Florida, and so on and so forth. Whether the object of your desire be near or far, near or far, results will always be the same. Subjectively, the object of your desire is never far off. Its intense nearness makes it remote from observation of the senses. It dwells in consciousness, and consciousness is closer than breath. It is nearer than our hands and our feet. Did you catch what Neville just shared with us? Did you get it? Hearts, if you felt that. Tina Garino, you do not really give to another, you resurrect what is within them. Is that not so powerful? <laughs> that is so powerful. 
healers of the world, spice up your life. <laughs> healers of the world, spice up, up level your healing. It's not about you. It's not about modalities. It's not about certifications. It's not about systems. It's about are you able to hold in your energy, your vibration, your visualization, the eye of spirit, the person in a state of health, in a state of joy, inspirers, teachers, readers, helpers, charitable. Are you able to hold in your heart, in your mind's eye, the vision of charity, love, prosper, prosperity, joy, healing within the person that you seek to awake this? Can you do that? That's the key. One of the things that I do in training intuitives and also helping people to feel empowered to have their own spiritual business is I tell them it's not about you. It's about finding out how you can get out of the way. Like how can you get out of the way and how can you let spirit occupy? Because the source of miracles is the source of all things. The source of miracles exists within you. The conscious reasoning, as Neville says, is what gets in the way. We start talking ourselves out of the blessing, of the healing, of the power of what it is that we can do. When all that's really required is that you can hold that space for somebody else. Oh, I wish my father was alive. Well, if he were alive, I might be way more damaged. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've had 20 some odd years to work through the kinks of the energy worms that were put inside. I've had some time is what I'm saying to work that out. But if I had presence of mind, wow, the work I could do, I could send that transmission. I could hold that space. I could see him. But even now I know that my father exists outside of time. And it's not just the abused that leaves aspects of herself or himself in moments in time. It's also the abuser. It's also the distorted one. It's also the aberrant one. He leaves or she leaves residual energy in those spaces as well. And so perhaps what I could do is reimagine my father now to save the aspects of himself that he left there and reimagine him now and to have conversations with him now to help clean up his timeline, which he's always connected to, whether he's here or not, he's connected to it, to clean up my timeline, to clean up my mom's timeline, to clean up my brother's timeline. I should do that for my brother. I should do that for my brother. I would love to do that for my brother. I've always thought about it for myself. All the ways my life could adjust in the present if I just go and correct it and if I just rethink it and reimagine it and if I just go save myself, I forgot about him. I forgot about him. Do you see the power of a consciousness? Do you see the power of a life? Do you see the power of your life? Do you see the magician that you are? As a woman speaks about herself, so she is for being and believing are one. It's a new day, my friend. It's time to believe rightly about yourself. And Tina, I know you've got your stuff around right and wrong and languaging, but nope, the time has come to think rightly about who it is that you are. Know yourself as you truly are. All the suffering, all the dissonance, all of this comes from not knowing who it is that you truly are and what you can do with the life that you have. Reimagining your life, reimagining a hymn to make it work for you, 
to make it affirm the power within you and within the God you're connected to. Thank you.